Our scripture this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. God's Word for His people, thanks be to God. Well, I am charged this morning to give an announcement, and I know that we don't always pay attention to announcements. In fact, if you work a job like I do in the school system, you get quite tired of announcements. And you begin to just kind of pay them no mind. Every morning we say the Pledge of Allegiance, which is a wonderful thing. And I'm so thankful that our school elects to continue to do that. But then it's followed by announcements, which usually after, if they go more than 30, 45 seconds, get kind of drowned out in the noise of young people. In our cafeteria at school, there are announcements flashing up on the TV screens. And I don't know how much attention the students truly pay, you know, those announcements. A lot of times in the afternoon, right before dismissal, there will be more announcements, usually about buses and changes and that sort of thing. And it never fails, even despite the fact that for many of them, the bus is the only way they're getting home. One will always ask, which bus number did they say? Because we don't always pay attention to announcements. Many of you that are working, announcements nowadays come through email. And if you're like me, you have so many of them that pop up, you just kind of have to scan the, the little memo that pops up to, to determine whether or not you want to read the rest of the announcement because it may or may not pertain to you. And if it doesn't pertain to you, you don't want to take the time to open the email to read it. We get a lot of announcements. And I go with the school system again. Every Sunday night, the school calls, no matter whether you're elementary, middle, or high. More announcements. We're now getting announcements from Vanceboro Town. Sometimes they're welcome. Sometimes it doesn't pertain to us. So at that point, we hang up the phone. Announcements, announcements, announcements. I'm charged this morning with giving you an announcement. The angel Gabriel was given charge to give Mary an announcement. And thank the Lord she listened. But I've got an announcement for you. Now, I really don't need to go into a whole lot of detail about what that announcement means. That's not really my job this Sunday. My job is to give you the announcement. Now, all four Gospels give an account about the crucifix, crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to make a few comments about the one that's given in the book of Luke. Now, the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to paraphrase this part, that Jesus was crucified. And then it says that there was a man named Joseph from a place called Arimathea who was a good man. In fact, he was part of the governing council of Jews, but he did not concede to crucifying Jesus. He didn't think they should do it. He knew that Jesus was good. So, Joseph of Arimathea goes up to Pontius Pilate. Now, I want you guys to understand that that is not just like going to your neighbor. A few days ago, I had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. with the twins on their school field trip. And we saw the White House. We did not get anywhere close to it. Because you couldn't. Because of the security. 
So going to Pontius Pilate would have been like kind of going to the president or the governor. It was not something you just arbitrarily did. He was not someone you just went and asked a favor. But Joseph of Arimathea went to ask a favor. And he said, this Jesus, this Galilean who had caused so much commotion, who you went back and forth with with the crowd, and eventually, like Bunky said, you washed your hands, and you just said, crucify him, crucify him, I want to be done with this matter. This man who may not mean anything to you, Pontius Pilate, but he means something to me, and if it's no bother to you, can I have his body? And so the Bible says that Joseph of Arimathea was given the body of Jesus of Nazareth and that he wrapped it in linens and that he laid it in a tomb. And it says that there were women who followed them to the tomb to see where Jesus was going to be laid. Now, just from that account, just from that one passage in the scriptures, we find out two very important things. Number one, Jesus was dead. Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, this man that had stirred up all of the region of Galilee and Judea, this man who history, faith or no faith, religion or no religion, history says there was a man named Jesus in this area who stirred people up. This man is dead. Now, I know some of you are saying, okay, we, we know that. But you need to understand that this is part of the announcement that I'm giving. So I'm, whether you've heard it or not, whether it's old news, good news, I'm charged to give you the announcement. And part of the announcement I'm giving to you is that Jesus was dead. Now, the second thing is that Jesus was buried. Well... Pastor, that's obvious. It's part of the announcement. I'm going to give it to you. Jesus was dead and Jesus was buried. His body was wrapped in the traditions of the day and wrapping it in linen. It was placed in a borrowed tomb because that tomb was not already set aside for Jesus. It was borrowed from Joseph of Arimathea and nobody, when I say nobody, nobody had ever been in that tomb before it was brand new and that type of tomb would not have been a place where just any old common person would have been buried it would have been an expensive type tomb joseph being a man of means said this is where jesus is going to lay jesus was dead jesus (coughs) was buried and the women who the Bible tells us was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and another gospel mentions another name, Salome, and there may have been a few others with them. This would have been Friday, and they checked out the place where Jesus' body was laid, because he was dead and he was buried, right? And they went home that night, And what did they do? They prepared the spices and they prepared the ointments and they prepared all of the customary things that a Jewish person would do for a loved one that had died a few days after they go to the tomb, they anoint the body, they prepare the body, they spice the body. That was part of their tradition. And all they knew at that time was that Jesus was dead and that's what they were supposed to do to honor a person that they had loved. We have a lot of funeral traditions here. Wakes and memorial services and gravesides and all of that sort of thing. People do it in different ways nowadays, but we have traditions. We have certain things that we typically do for loved ones that pass away. And this is what these women were doing. Because what they knew was that this man, this miracle worker, that was something so different about him that they decided to leave their homes and villages and to follow him. Not just the twelve disciples, but the women that accompanied them. And many others that the Bible does not mention by name. These people were leaving their homes, leaving their farms, leaving their fishing nets, leaving their 
tax collecting offices. And they were going to follow this man of whom something about him was different. And these women had spent the last few years of their life following and listening and witnessing miracles. Mary Magdalene herself had been tormented by evil spirits. And this man, Jesus, had delivered her. But now, Jesus was dead and Jesus was buried. And all they knew to do was pay their respects. Now, they couldn't do it the next day because it was the Sabbath. And they were Jews. And Jews did nothing that would have been considered work on the Sabbath day. They could not prepare. They had done that the night before. So that on the Sabbath day, that Saturday, they would spend time reflecting and worshiping as customary of the Jews. But then the Bible says that early the next morning, while the first day of the week was dawning. You want to know why some churches have sunrise services? Because that's when the women were going to the tomb. The tomb, yes, again, remember, Jesus was dead and Jesus was buried. And they carried their little baskets. I can just picture them. Little baskets full of spikenard and myrrh and whatever else ointments they used at those times. And one gospel mentions that they were wondering, we know we need to do this. This is the respectful thing to do to, a, to anoint his body. But how are we going to move the huge stone that we saw rolled in front of it? So they were having these honest, reasonable conversations. Because all they knew at that time, that early, early Sunday morning, 2,000 years ago, was that they had a basket of ointments and that Jesus, the one they had followed, was dead and that he had been buried. What they were expecting to do was to anoint the body of a dead loved one. Somebody that had meant a great deal to them, but the situation had changed. Perhaps this run of goodness was over, not really knowing what they were going to do after that. Many of the disciples had spread and scattered, and some of them had collected at Peter's relative's house, but nobody really know, you knew what they were going to do. They just knew that Jesus was dead, that Jesus was buried. They had to anoint his body. And on the dawn of Easter 2,000 years ago, they go there, the stone is rolled back, and nothing is in the tomb. Nobody, no nothing, except a few scraps of linen. And so they are perplexed. They don't understand. They are bewildered. They knew that Jesus was dead. They saw his body placed in the grave. The gospel specifically tells us that they were there to see where he was buried because they were going to go anoint him. But when they got there, he was gone. And I may be mixing a few of the gospel stories together, but that's okay because it's all God's word. But the angel comes to them and says... Why are you looking for Jesus? Well, what do you mean? We're looking for him because we want to anoint his body. We loved him. He was great. He delivered us in so many ways. He really gave us life. You just don't understand. I, says Mary Magdalene, I was tormented. And now I'm free. But now he's dead. And we came to anoint him. What do you mean, why are we looking for him? But the angel says, but he's not here. Well, what do you mean? You're looking for the dead. Well, that's right. Because Jesus died. He hung on that cross. He gave up the ghost. He bled. His head dropped. His eyes closed. I saw his body being taken down. It was limp. I saw him being wrapped. I saw him being placed in the tomb. Of course I'm looking for the dead Jesus. But the angel says, no, 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 you got it wrong. He's not dead anymore. He's not dead anymore. 
Don't you remember what he said to you a few months back? That the Son of Man must be turned over to sinful men, must be crucified, dead, and on the third day he would rose, rise from the dead. Don't you remember? Didn't you get that announcement or did you just blip that one out? Or did you just let that pass over you? Or did you think it didn't pertain to you? Did you delete that email? Oh, and they say, oh no, now we remember. I did get that message. I did get that announcement. And you're saying now it's happened? The angel said, yeah. You don't see his body, do you? It ain't there. He's alive. He's alive. Now go and tell the disciples. Give them the announcement. That Jesus was dead. Jesus was buried. And now he's alive. And the Bible says that they ran back and they told the other disciples. And the other disciples, they weren't quite ready to receive the announcement either. Because they said, oh, y'all are just a bunch of silly old women telling old wives tales. Peter said, all right, if you won't shut up about it, I'm going to go down there myself and see. And Peter went in. And guess what? No body. No Jesus. And the women had said, well, Jesus is going to meet you in Galilee. And so he goes. They go. And Jesus is there. And so 2,000 years later, the announcement is the same. It is the apostles' doctrine. It is the apostles' teaching. If you read the book of Acts, this is what they focused on. This is what they preached. This is what Paul went to uh, Rome and Greece and all over Asia and, and, and the Middle East preaching and teaching. This is the apostles' message. This is their announcement. That Jesus Christ of Nazareth is dead, buried, and alive again. This is the announcement. And some today aren't receiving the announcement. But there's still hope. Because we're going to keep sending that announcement out. And we may do it through email. We may do it on Facebook. We may do it here in the church. We may do it in the streets. But our job as the church is to keep saying the announcement. It doesn't matter if people say they're tired of hearing it. It doesn't matter if people are dismissing it right now. They've got time as long as there is air in their lungs and a beat on their heart. They've got time to open up the announcement, to listen to the announcement, and to believe the announcement. Christ is dead. Christ is buried. Christ rose on the third day. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail this morning explaining exactly what that means. All the theology behind it and this and that. Paul does that for us in several of his letters. And there's a time and a place for that. But I said at the beginning and I'm saying it now, my message this morning my job this morning is to give you the announcement and for you to take it out of here and give somebody else the announcement and pass it on that Christ is alive. And if you want to just simply explain, if you're just sitting on the edge of your seat and you say, well, I want a little bit of explanation before I leave with that announcement, just in case somebody asks what it all means. I thought about this, something my father told me the other day about a situation happening in our life, a situation that is very difficult for our family right now, and it seems like that, that things aren't, aren't just going right, and we've gotten, gotten some bad news, and this and that and the other. And God said, well, 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 Mike, you know he calls me Mikey. He says, you preach this every Sunday. What, what, where's your faith at? What, what do you think you know, God is doing with this situation? And I, I, immediately my mind went to the Easter message and I said, what does the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ mean? What, what is the resurrection all about? How can I simply put it without giving them a bunch of theology? And I said, well, it, what it means to me is that God can. And if I were to write it, I would say God can dot, 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 and you fill in the dots because it's your life. It's your situations. It's your struggles. It's your heartache. It's your broken heart. It's your guilt. It's your shame. It's your burden. But whatever it is, God can. Dot, 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 you fill in the blank. 
If God can raise Jesus from the dead, remember, dead, buried, alive, then God can do whatever it is in your life. Trust and have faith and believe. And it may not always be exactly how you're working it up in your mind. But our faith tells us that God is working all things together for good for those that love him. Now, I began the message with perhaps somewhat of an unusual text for Easter Sunday. But I, I want you to understand that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Without it, it is impossible to please God. And that he that cometh to God must believe first that he is, that there is a God, and second, that God can. Whatever you're facing, God can. May God bless you. I hope you and your family have a wonderful Easter day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you can. We cannot even contemplate all that you can do. It is infinite. And we pray that today on this Easter morning, celebrating the greatest miracle of all, and that is the resuscitation of life after three days. If you can do that, there is nothing going on in our world that you can't handle. We can't handle it, but you can, God. May we believe, may we remember, may we have faith. In Jesus' name, amen.